Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's the MSP Tech Talk lecture number five as we're starting to wrap up summer quarter. Boy, howdy, it's still summer till the 21st. And I'll talk about, uh, we're actually going to overflow to the 26th with the last lecture. But in any event, we have had a good summer. So we have reviewed some interesting topics as summer quarters are meant to be. Today, we bring back blockchain. We'll get to that in just a minute, a little bit of housekeeping. Be sure to use the questions feature to ask your questions. And that's an important part of today. We're gonna to have some short presentations initially and then cut over to Q&A. And you'll see when we get to that slide, it kind of becomes what I call an un-webinar at that point. And it, it is what you make it. So hopefully we're gonna spur a bunch of questions on blockchain. There's a, twi a particular twist to the MSP channel, the partner channel with this presentation. Uh, other housekeeping is next week, I'm at GlueCon in Phoenix on Monday. I'm at SolarWinds um, Empower on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, if you find yourself at either of those in Phoenix. And then I'm off to Microsoft Ignite as well as uh, Salesforce Dreamforce after that, followed by Boy, howdy, uh, Spiceworks, Spice World in Austin, and a couple of others I'll be announcing. So if you find yourself at any of those, love to get together with you. And again, in particular, Glucon next week, as well as the Solar Winds event. They're only four miles apart over in Scottsdale. With that said, we welcome you. It is midday in the Pacific, uh, mid-afternoon on the East Coast, evening in Europe, and very early morning in Asia. And it's a popular topic. Uh, blockchain is getting some traction. So without further ado, let's jump into the introductions. Uh, for those of you that I have not met in the past, Harry Brelsford from SMB Nation. We are a 19-year-old community predicated originally on small business server. But like you, we have transformed and we're having conversations about Office 365 Azure blockchain. And then my favorite is analytics. So we have transformed. I hope you're using the MSP Tech Talks to do that as well. Let's go around the horn, one minute introductions, and then each each of you have a slide to tell your story. So Grace, if you could introduce yourself, please. Come on off mute. You got this, Grace. Let's see, while we're double checking that, if we could, uh, Mike Moore, are you there? We'll come back to Grace. Mike Moore? All right, thanks, Harry. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Moore. I'm with Averitech. Uh, we're a SaaS company focused on uh, marketing I automation said, for channels. Uh, okay, Grace, hold your horses. Marketing automation for channels. Uh, Grace, hold your horses. Mike, um, The uh, wh why don't you also quickly give a shout out to how the community would know you from the old Microsoft TS2 days and so on. Sure, yeah. I've had a career for more than 20 years in uh, tech and spent 11 years at Microsoft uh, doing TS2 events as one of the programs. That's when I met Harry back in the uh, days when we're working on small business server and all that good stuff. Ran the Microsoft Across America tour for a while. Those were those seven trucks driving around with all kinds of cool stuff inside that we worked with partners on. So uh, it's a pleasure to, to work again with Harry here. So thanks for having me. All right, back at you, Grace. I think we got audio. Grace, introduce yourself. So can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I'm the CEO of Slinger.io. We're a low code application platform. So we build business applications that integrate well with other business applications in the MSP space. We do a lot of work with uh, a partner company of ours called Disrupt IT who help MSPs augment uh, the functionality in tools like Autotask to make them better, more automated. Uh, and on the blockchain side, we integrate with the Ethereum blockchain at this juncture to create things like an application for a transfer agent to use to manage a security token, for an issuer to use to issue tokens, all the way through to accounting types of uh, applications for people that are starting to get into that space. All righty, and Grace, people might remember you from your prior branding idea2.com when you participated in some beer fest uh, back in the day in some of our shows. So. Uh, Thomas Beck, uh, you work with Grace, sir. Uh, you're in Seattle as well. Introduce yourself. 
Yes, hi. I have the pleasure of working with Grace at Slinger. I was actually uh, their first victim uh, many moons ago as a uh, uh, and the idea two iteration and I'm excited to have been working with them for about the last year and a half, uh, helping companies really, you know, create better software faster uh, that, you know, can do things that they can't do with other software they can find in the SaaS environment and integrating all of their applications inside of their technology ecosystems. And now that includes, you know, blockchain um, integrations and application development as well. There you go. And if you look hard enough, folks, uh, you'll see I interviewed Thomas um, some time ago and you'll see up on our YouTube channel. So SMB Nation, all uh, two words, and you can find that interview. And then finally, I'll make mention that we're underwritten by SolarWinds. As you know, we have transformed the way we deliver content. And so we are underwritten by generous sponsors, much like National Public Radio and Public TV. So maybe I have a inner Mr. Rogers in me. But we appreciate SolarWinds um, making this possible. We'll talk about them in just a little while. Let's move on to the next slide. So what I want to do is level set in terms of what we did in May of 2018 with the blockchain introduction lecture led by David Hamm and his team. And that got us thinking. And, and quite frankly, we got a really positive response. And so what I want to encourage you to do, not right now, but make a note, go to the SMB Nation YouTube channel and scroll down, uh, probably it's row four, you'll see the blockchain uh, conversation. Go ahead and watch that to see the slide deck. And as a bonus, I'm going to go ahead and uh, email you this slide deck again uh, tomorrow with our thank you note. But Basically, uh, what David did for us is he, on the far right, outlined the timeline of blockchain um, all the way from 1991 with academic research to about uh, 10 years ago with the mysterious gentleman with Bitcoin. And then he overlaid that conversation with the, uh, the Gartner hype curve. And this, this was a really interesting part of the lecture. So what uh, his contention is, based on his research, is if you follow the hype curve of any technology, be it IoT, uh, uh, you know, just any technology we've worked with in our career, there's that initial excitement. You know, one, a, a low-hanging example would be the internet in the late, mid-late 1990s. So it was hyped up, right? And then we had the trough of disappointment as you proceed further to the right where it became a reality. And then as you go further to the right, it, it, it became ubiquitous that, that we just use it every day. We don't even think that much about the internet. Um, and this is how technology works according to Gartner. So I know this is a little hard to see, but if you're looking at the top of the hype curve and just a little down, you'll see that we have cryptocurrency and blockchain. And so it was David Hamm's contention, again, based on his research, that we've had the cryptocurrency hype and now we're headed into a trough of disappointment which again is good um, because that's where you see the long-term players in my humble opinion emerge right that, uh, that, that 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 that's where coming out of the trough of disappointment with the internet that's where we started to see um, for example facebook come into business and they caught it at the right time when it becomes fairly mainstream so the point is, I'd rather be early than late, but you could argue we're early in blockchain. Our guests will speak more towards that in a minute in terms of what that means for platforms and partners. Uh, here's my take on, on what blockchain is, is that it's a distributed ledger technology. So first of all, I understand it, okay? That, that is a little bit like Warren Buffett and his investments in IHOP. He understands IHOP. He made an investment in that restaurant chain. So that's kind of my first criterion is, is I actually understand it versus conversations I had last week at Channel Pro in Boston where they had some presentations on uh, IoT, and that's part because Channel Pro is owned by a publisher called e &H. e h has a new pub on IoT. Guys, I, IoT, I mean, I, what is IoT? You know, is it? sensors on the Fred Hutch Cancer Center Hospital around South Lake Union monitoring heat. Um, it, 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 it's this thing versus blockchain, I get. Technically, for those of us that remember the OSI model, 
we're talking about encrypted blocks that are linked together in a chain-like manner, uh, creates a tamper-proof distributed network. And I liken it to some listeners on this call will recall SimForm in the mid-late 2000s. God bless SimForm. They launched right into the recession in 08 over on Lake Union and uh, were ultimately acquired in a down round. God bless them. But that is essentially what they were doing with distributed storage, right? That, that, that The concept was blockchain. Blockchain is known as a single source of truth and it's sharing between partners. The reconciliation's easier and there's an audit trail company. One of my favorite examples and the panelists are gonna do a much better job of explaining this, but one of my favorite examples, uh, let's just put cryptocurrency back up here on the bookshelf. One of my favorite examples is the shipping industry across borders. So the ships that come in to Seattle from China and the paperwork that's involved in that, the tariffs that's involved in that, the funds that are involved in that, the complexity, perfect example of blockchain with having a secure ledger. And that would be a private blockchain, right? That would be one where the the customers and, 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 and the stakeholders agree to use blockchain for essentially, again, in my eyes, supply chain management. Uh, public um, sharing would be the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and so on. And then another interesting thing, and I wanna, I wanna give a shout out to Blockchain Bonanza from CRN in June of 2018. You can get it online or if you still get CRN, but really wanna give a shout out to the author of this where uh, I used it as a primary source in my research um, they talked about a competitor for blockchain being SQL Server. And I have a SQL background from my Great Plains days in the 90s. And so I said, well, that's interesting. And they were like, you know, SQL, if you have a high transaction environment um, that needs speed, SQL may be your answer for, for that e-commerce function. Blockchain may not be. And so that was interesting. And again, shout out to CRN, Blockchain Bonanza. Encourage you to click over and read it. Leave a comment for the author. With that said, oops, we have a, a solar wind moment. Let's take care of those that take care of us. So Solar Winds has signed on as a community sponsor for SMB Nation. Jenny, I actually think I turned it over to you. Folks, we're gonna catch a quick solar winds video and you'll need to use your computer speakers. This will not come over your phone system. So, Jenny, if you want to let them, let them rip. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first release video for N Central, filmed right here in Ottawa, in front of our beloved Parliament buildings. You should come visit sometime, but not in the winter. It's really too cold here. I'm Omar Cahill, Product Marketing Manager for Ncentral, and with me is Chris Reed, Product Manager for Ncentral. And we're here to tell you about how you can see more, know more, and do more with both Ncentral 11.2 and 12.0. Let's start with how you can see more. Take it away, Chris. Thanks, Omar. How many times have you had one of your end users call you and say, I can't access Office 365, or when I go to this website, it seems really slow? NetPath is a great way to understand where that problem may be occurring. Is it, for example, a problem with the local LAN that the customer's in, or is it a problem with a, a hop or a node somewhere along the way out in the public infrastructure? NetPath lets you understand where the problem may lie, and even better if it's a public node, tells you who owns it and how to contact them. NetPath lets you map from any source server or workstation that you manage by showing you the path it would take to reach any destination IP address or hostname. The primary use case here is to map your customer's connectivity to popular cloud applications such as Office 365, G Suite, Amazon Web Services, or any networked application that's part of their business. NetPath reveals each hop, node, and link it would take for you to reach the destination, making it easy to troubleshoot hotspots or bottlenecks throughout the whole path. Not only can you see within your own network, but the ISP and cloud provider's infrastructure will be displayed to you within the NetPath window. When a problem does occur, NetPath gives you the contact email address and phone number for wherever the problem is occurring so that you can more easily reach out to whoever owns that infrastructure and help them troubleshoot the problem. I can keep going, but check it out for yourself in the Central UI under the View NetPath menu. Click to add a path by selecting a server or workstation, typing in a destination, and within a few minutes, you'll have a path monitored within Central. 
The data is stored historically for 30 days, so you can even go back in time to troubleshoot any issues. Get started now by upgrading your Central server to version 12.0. Once the upgrade is complete, you'll have five free paths to use for 30 days. Give it a try today. We left some common URLs in the description below. All righty, and folks, can I confirm that you can see my screen again, please? We can see your screen, Harry, you're up. Okay, great. And Jenny, do we have a poll question? And I'll do a little bit of housekeeping while the poll question's being answered. We do. Okay, great. If you wanna bring that up, folks, while Jenny brings that up, a couple of things, be sure to use the question feature on the uh, control panel to ask your question. Jenny's gonna read them. And we're gonna hold off on your questions until we let everybody have their say about blockchain. We think it's gonna help you with uh, coming up with, with, with what your questions would be. And if you arrived a little bit late, uh, I'll be at Glucon and SolarWinds and Power both in Scottsdale next week if you wanna get together for good old community time. Jenny, if you like, go ahead and close it out. And if you could read the results, I don't have the, the visualization of the screen. We're gonna bypass, so you can just keep going with that, Harry. Okay, no problem. All right, so am I back on, Jenny? You are ready to rock and roll. All right, so let's do Mike's take. Mike? You're up on the screen, my friend. Introduce yourself once again for those that came late. Talk about the article you published, and I want to have you. I, I, I want to have you call out a couple of key points in your article, man. Okay, thanks, Harry. Um, so Mike Moore with Averitech. So Averitech's a SaaS company focused on marketing automation software for channels. Um, so the idea is, you know, if you're working with Microsoft, you're working with uh, Sonic Wall, RSA, you know, these kind of companies. They want to be able to share their marketing materials with their channel partners so that you can go out, share them with customers, prospects, uh, teach people interesting things, attract them to your business, become customers, all that good stuff. Um, so our piece of software is, is uh, kind of rooted in that. It started with an idea way back in the day when I was at Microsoft uh, working in the, the organization there, the seminar team, and we created a website called Microsoft Partner Events. Um, so Veritex, the company that built that for us, and now here I am uh, 14 years later working for the company and, uh, and helping others with it. Uh, and and Mike, piece, Mike where, yeah. where, where are you based out of? I hope you're not in harm's way. I have CNN on, in the background with that uh, hurricane. Are you are you in the Carolinas? No, I'm in Boston. I'm, uh, I'm, we'll probably see it beginning of next week, whatever's left of it. But yeah, and thankfully our office is actually right across the water from you and Edmonds. So, you know, when you take the ferry across, you can wave to that building there. Our guys are on the top floor enjoying Perfect. a nice view. Well, so define, uh, yeah, define blockchain. From your well, point of you know, so I'm looking at it more from the business perspective. So there's a lot of stuff written, including like the article that you referenced in CRN. A lot of people are looking at blockchain uh, from the perspective of how the channel can take it and use it as a tool to solve customer problems. And I think there's obviously a great, great financial opportunity and a great problem solving opportunity because there are application scenarios where blockchain will be useful. My take's a little different. So I think about it more on the side of the relationships between brands like a Microsoft or, you know, even, uh, you know, I mean, pick, pick any product that's sold, you know, HP, Microsoft, Dell, whatever's out there in the channel that people are, are selling as part of a solution to end customers. And I think about the role that blockchain could play in the exchange between channel partners, you know, MSPs, uh, distributors, brands, all of that. So let me give you a scenario. Uh, new product, new up and coming product comes out and you hear about it on one of Harry's webcasts and you think it sounds great and you've got customers who have a need for it, um, but it's not yet available through distribution. You have to go direct with the company to get it, to be able to give it to your customers. And you go to them and you click on their become a partner page and they ask you for all kinds of information, all kinds of financials, all kinds of customer references and all kinds of 
you know, kind of new partner onboarding questions. Very typical, right? Especially yeah. for emerging companies who are not yet in distribution. Distribution deals with a lot of that stuff, makes those kind of things go away in most cases, hopefully. Hmm. The yeah. problem though, is that you have already told all of that information to existing vendors. And quite frankly, once you, it's like a credit app, like right, once I fill it out, it's obsolete because this information is ever changing. Uh, I don't also know about the security of how, how I'm providing that information, how you're gonna use it, how it's gonna be stored. So what if, in my article that, that Harry's linked here goes through several scenarios, what if I had a digital wallet for my company and part of that held the answers to all those typical kind of questions that I have to answer to become a new partner with your company. And so instead of filling out your app, which you spent a lot of time as a vendor to go develop and all that kind of nonsense, um, instead I just have my digital wallet and I, with a couple of clicks, share the information that's appropriate. You are receiving it to kind of your end of the blockchain, right? So that we're, we're kind of sharing the information that's required to pass it so you know uh, because of the trust, security, uh, and kind of all the attributes of the blockchain, that the information I'm providing is not only accurate, but trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And then we can quickly do business. And quite frankly, what if it's a, a short-term thing versus a long-term thing? You know, if I just want to do one deal with you because that's all I've got, I don't expect to do more anytime soon. You know, I would not even waste my time filling out your big partner app, right? I would just walk away. So the scenarios that I go through in the article and we can talk more about as we go through it would be not just signing on new as a partner, but right now, you know, part of the mystery, and this is a lot of the work that I do with companies today is um, looking inside the organization. Like, so you fill out your new partner app, then they have all kinds of information that they store about you in their partner relationship management software, PRM, right? Uh, you don't know what they're sharing with each other. You don't know what information they have. You don't know how they're evaluating your performance and deciding which investments to make and which partners, what's gonna get you to gold level versus staying at silver. So there's a lot of other information that the blockchain and kind of the, the opportunity for transparency that provides, I believe there's a whole suite of tools that could be blockchain enabled that are channel apps and channel technology that would be beneficial to the brands who are trying to put these programs together as kind of vendors that work with you. And then it would also be beneficial to the, the MSPs, channel partners, solution providers, resellers, whatever kind of partner type they are, to give more transparency, more control over your data and information, and quite frankly, uh, reduce the friction that's involved in all of these partnerships. Well, I, my, my, if you don't mind, I think that's a key point is friction reduction. The CRN article went into that, and that's that's kind of my understanding of blockchain just from a commerce perspective is um, increased efficiency, right? That's, yeah part of its value drop. Well, you know, the movement of money. So, right, this is a point that I make in, in my article is saying like uh, blockchain is more than Bitcoin, right? So cryptocurrency yeah. is obviously a big part of the blockchain. Um, and it's, it's kind of like, what is it? Cryptocurrency is the what it is, you know, the how we get it done is through the blockchain, right? Like that's the underlying technology that makes it, uh, right. makes it trustworthy and all that kind of stuff. So I look at this, you know, again, uh, cryptocurrency and kind of how people get paid can certainly be a dimension of this. Uh, but even things like if you look at Dun and Bradstreet, so Dun and Bradstreet's entire business is uh, credit applications and credit worthiness, right? Like they are the de facto, the gold standard in the industry. If you want to get credit for your business, you you have a DNB profile, you have a DNB number. Banks and other business entities use that information and they trust it. Now, DNB actually takes all your information and sells that as a product too, right? That's a side business for them. <laughs> but even they are coming out with a blockchain product to say, what if as what if you had a blockchain, you know, identifier, your your unique ID that was part of your DNB profile? So not just your DNB number, right? But now you've got an extension of that. So they want to plug into all kinds of banking and other systems and use the DNB blockchain. So people will create these blockchain services, you know, identity providers or whatever you want to call it, you know, but that's where how that gets used in various applications and business scenarios. So I think the channel can benefit a ton from having apps like that in terms of how two companies come together and do business with one another. And then I think it also can inspire ideas of how you might use this technology to solve the problems of your customers. And that's where, you know, Grace and her company come in and kind of the tools that they provide, right? There's, there's kind of building blockchain-based solutions and how you can do that. Right. 
And that's, that's not my area of expertise. I understand it, but I'm thinking more from the business standpoint, like what is the promise of blockchain and how can it solve some of the, that friction that we've talked about? Quick question for you, um, and feel free to challenge me, of course, but early in the webinar, and if you came in late, I made a statement about, I understand blockchain, and it may be because I, 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 I fancy myself being half business and half technical. Um, I still am struggling with the applicability, the ability to meet biweekly payroll and, and generate cash flow with IoT. IoT still strikes me as this fun, you know, Carlos Castaneda sit on a mountaintop and ask what is IoT. Blockchain feels like it's being used and it's here today. Feel free to challenge me, but do you share that thought that, that blockchain is here and now and maybe IoT while here and now, but it's 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 a brother from another mother. <laughs> uh, I definitely think blockchain's here and now, but I also agree with kind of the the reference you put in about the crossing the chasm, kind of uh, you know the slide there. Like we're on a journey, right? Like it's a technology, and in many ways, blockchain's been around in various forms. Kind of the premise, at least, and, and kind of the execution is maybe varied. But um, I look at the IoT stuff, and I my first job after leaving Microsoft was at GE Healthcare. Right. And right. so, you know, so coming from coming from that, you know, spending uh, I spent about 10 months there before before I moved on to progress software, which was more kind of low code app dev stuff like Grace is going to talk about. Uh, but the the so I look at IOT and I say right now, if I pull up my Google Wi-Fi app on my my phone, it'll tell me I have 24 Internet connected devices in my house right now. Not all of them are computers. So to me, that's IOT. Right. It's like we have data coming out of all these things now figuring out what the heck to do with all that stuff yeah. in, a, in a way that you can monetize. Right. Like, you know, part of it is like home automation control. Right. I'm sitting in my house with 24 connected devices, you know, but when my wife wants to change the temperature and the thermostat, she's asking me because she doesn't even want to deal with the stuff. So making it human, making it consumable with all these devices that generate all this data, you know, understanding what to do with it, solving customer problems with it. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, you know, before we become the Jetsons or whatever, but you know, it's it's exciting stuff too, I think. All righty. Hey, any final comments before I go to Grace's slide? No, I'm just, uh, I'm in, interested to see what questions the folks have and kind of where they're seeing it. And I think that this is, uh, my perspective on it too, is that there's stuff where sometimes the industry moves faster than the customer with a new technology. So I, I doubt that there are customers who are calling out and saying, what's this blockchain stuff and, and is there something we can do with it that will benefit my business? I think yeah. the industry will come out and kind of push some use cases first and then customers will eventually come around on this stuff. So I think, you know, we've got some time to get prepared to be able to solve uh, yeah, problems with this. Um, but I think also there's a land grab opportunity, especially when you start talking about my proposal around blockchain and the channel. Who can do this? Who can set up these applications or be the central identity provider for the channel? You know, could it be a large DISTI? Could it be, you know, someone else? Someone is going to do a land grab and kind of be out there and try to be the de facto solution in this space. But nobody's doing it yet. It's all admittedly theoretical stuff. It's all possible, but nobody's making the investment to go build this stuff and make it happen today. Because well, part of it also is like, how do you make money on that, right? By being the identity provider, who pays for it, all that kind of stuff. So there are questions to be answered. Yeah, I agree. On the consumer side of that equation, you know, there's a project called doc.io, and they're attempting to sort of disintermediate the LinkedIn's of the world to allow you to have better control over your data, and you you decide which applications you're going to share it with, and and there's a token economy around that. But I think, you know, the complexity is that I don't think the um, the tokenomic side has been reliably cracked uh, on mass. You know, I think there are people out there with great ideas that are bringing forth tokens, and um, but I don't think that anybody's really hit the for repeatable formula yet. So what I'm what we're working on now is that just as you described. You know, blockchain is coming out like IoT did in a in a vacuum, in a silo. You know, it's sort of standing alone by itself, and people are madly putting Z apps up on the Ethereum blockchain that can do very little because there really isn't a 
solid model around something that handle happens 100% on chain. So what we have been focusing on is working on some um, sort of infrastructure project to support security tokens and to support new blockchain business models that will enca encapsulate a lot of what has to happen on chain, but also the, the correlating activities that have to happen off chain. And so a case in point, you know, there are security tokens now being f registered with the SEC under both Reg A, uh, which is the crowdfunding regulation, and even S1, which are the, you know, larger, more um, um, sort of NYSE type of registration statement. And these all today have to follow the same path as other securities. So as if you were doing an IPO. So you have to have, for example, a transfer agent in place. So as we visit the ecosystem of what it takes to issue and manage a security today, none of the systems that are in place today really work with a blockchain type of a distributed ledger. For example, if you think about the activity of clearing after a trade, that, you know, that happens on the blockchain. So now you no longer have a clearing firm. However, the clearing firm, you know, produces statements. <laughs> the clearing firm gives you your mark to market at the end of every month, along with all of your other assets. And clearing firms, you know, feed data into other sort of mid back office systems for broker dealers who have a, a an array of clearing firms and, and different types of products, but they want to supply you know, one statement to their client. And, and then you look at, you know, what are the functions of a transfer agent? Well, they, they issue dividends. So, in order to issue dividends and then a 1099, sorry, but you actually need to correlate that uh, Ethereum wallet address with the name, address, and serial number of the human that owns the token so that you know both who to assign a, a dividend to and, and, and where the 1099 goes. Well, where's the 1099 going? Well, you're gonna need to be able to integrate into a 1099 production house with all of the data that they need to to you know, reliably produce the, the tax documentation at the end of the year, you know, and then just the simple stuff like Grandma went long, you know, a thousand dots at IO and she died, you know, who's going to be the transfer agent that can move those securities to the next of kin? And in all of those processes that exist today, need to also map to uh, similar processes in new systems on the blockchain. So that's that's what we're focused on. So our our uh, platform lets us sort of keep up with the changes. Uh, because we're a low-code platform, we're not writing custom code every time it looks like a regulatory shift is gonna happen and a new requirement's gonna pop up. We're, we're literally able to keep up with the environment and, and the necessary uh, integrations that need to happen to make to make this all work together. You know, at leaving out, uh, one of the other most important pieces that's missing is tax accounting. You know, there is no, way there's no automated way today for all these hedge funds that are trading cryptocurrency to produce a you know a tax document at the end of the year and so that that too is is an instance where because we have our platform we can integrate with exchanges pull data do the math inside and and distribute it where into whatever system it needs to go to 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 satisfy a downstream process yep Yep, that, that, that sounds good. And then, Grace, I think I had mentioned to you uh, in a prior conversation, if not, forgive me, but the state of Washington being one of the early states to legalize the, uh, the cannabis industry, um, they accept their tax payments uh, via cryptocurrency. And it was a really, really cool conversation with the director of the board, uh, the Cannabis and Liquor Board down in Olympia, because, you know, he was painting this picture of hyperinflation in the 1930s Germany, where people were bringing in wheelbarrows of cash <laughs> to pay their taxes, and 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 he said that's problematic on a couple of fronts. They're walking into an office building in Olympia, Washington, with cash, right? So, right, right there, we have a problem. A crafty um, thief might just set up shop outside that door. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> And so they led the way on facilitating the payment of uh, taxes by cryptocurrency. And, you know, it, it, it brings up a longer conversation. It's not why we're here today, but, you know, what if you're not allowed to work within the banking system? 
right? And, and I'll just leave that dangling out there. But why don't we move on? Um, probably going to revisit blockchain in uh, the fall quarter again. Jenny and I are locking down the agenda later today. So with that said, let's get to the heart of the matter. Let me do a sanity check, and we're pretty much on time. Um, 12.38 Pacific. So folks, now we become an unconference or an unwebinar format. We've uh, given you, let's, let's just recap what we've done. I gave a pointer to David Ham's lecture in May, in spring quarter. Can encourage you to watch that webinar. Then I went on and uh, provided a very basic definition of blockchain that was compounded by Mike and Grace with two different views of that. So hopefully that has generated some questions and Jennifer Hallmark is gonna ask the questions. If for some reason we're light on the questions today, then uh, that, 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 that's it. That's what an unconference is and we will have filled a void and uh, there we be. So Jenny, if you don't mind, um, what, what do we got hanging out there with respect to the partners, blockchain and so on? Well, our friend David Hamm left us quite a long question here. So the speed right and scalability yeah. issue, while publicly disturbed blockchain offers uh, cryptographic validation and transactions. Well, and hey, Jenny, if you don't mind interrupting, uh, can is David Hamm available to come on mic if you want to elevate him? That would be good because this question's quite a lot. Yeah, he's well, like and he's this. also he's also the man from May. So, Mr. May, David Ham, David, if if you have the ability to come on mic, uh, we appreciate it and and participate in the dialogue. Give that just a second um, while Jenny's. Ah, oh, there he is. He just popped up on the control panel. David, good afternoon, okay. sir. Can and once again. Me? Thank you for what you did in May with uh, your presentation. I borrowed parts of it, but I gave you accreditation. Um, with, with that said, go ahead and uh, engage in a dialogue with us. Ask your question or, or make your comment. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great, super. Um, my question centers around the speed and scalability issues. Um, and as I wrote it, I'll just read it. While publicly distributed blockchains offer immutability, cryptographic validation of transactions and distributed numerous node nature, the distributed numerous node nature of current technology while providing high Byzantine fault tolerance. It challenges the attainable transaction speed. My contention is that fully publicly distributed blockchain technology as it exists today is untenable for fast high transaction rate technologies like IoT and credit card transactions as examples. We're keeping in mind that you know, the ICOs and cryptocurrencies really are operating at a minor fraction of the total market. And so a significant market capture is really, you know, not doable with current technology. Some envision that blockchains achieving higher transaction speed and manageable storage requirements will force usable blockchains to be quasi-private, meaning on private servers and um, really substantially private networks. How do you envision these speed and scalability issues being resolved such that truly usable blockchains um, come to fruition and we can really cross the, the chasm of disillusionment as the hype cycle paints it? Go ahead. Yeah, Grace, let's put that out for you and Thomas. Yeah. And so the, the, there are a lot of new blockchains in development right now that are seeking to address that problem. But I, I believe that like the internet, when we all watch the Sistine Chapel unload on our screens over a two and a half to three minute period, that these problems will get solved over time, even by Ethereum and, and you know, and some of these newer follow on ones that, that you're going to see coming down the pike. I mean, the issue is from a security token perspective is that you need enough nodes in order for a blockchain to be sort of secure. Um, and so it's, you know, they're not, everybody's not going to win. There are going to be a lot of failures out there and people that are issuing tokens need to think about that in advance of, you know, deploying on one blockchain versus another and think about their white papers and smart contracts to describe, you know, a fallback position if, if any of those blockchains didn't, don't make it. But, but I, you know, I, I have a lot of confidence that the technology is going to get handled. I mean, it, it always does. 
there's a lot of money getting thrown at blockchain. I believe it's in part because it is forcing a technology turnover that a lot of people are going to make money on. And my favorite story is I have a friend that used to run sales for IGT, which was the biggest slot machine, video poker, but, you know, machine company. And, and when they came out with a, and a video machine, a poker machine, they last seven years typically. When they came out with the cards that you had to use instead of the cash, they forced that entire turnover after three years instead of seven. And, and so everybody piled on because now suddenly everybody, all the casinos, one casino bought it, everybody had to buy, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, I mean, I look around and, and you know, in my own team and, and, and others, some of the smartest people in the world that are working on this, I, I, don't, see how, um, I don't see how it doesn't get solved. There we go. And I'll add, Grace, I'll add to that. I, I'm going back to my, my new favorite article in CRN where I talked about SQL servers um, and they, they're quoting a gentleman. Harry, Harry you're, not, you're not supposed to compliment yourself, Harry. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's, oh, it's become in vogue. <laughs> now, Grace, on your prior slide, I put kindness because I think you have really become kind. So, so, so <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But uh, basically, and in, in, towards the end of the article, they say, uh, why and what's your use case, right? Is you're doing discovery about blockchain. And this is a channel partner organization that consults in this area. Uh, is it something like a high performance, rapid transactional database? If you want that, go for SQL servers. So that's towards the end of the CRN article that you can look up online. Um, hope, hope that helps, David, provide some perspective. I know you spend a lot of time in the area. Would, would, would you like to make a follow-on comment, and then we'll see what else Jenny has? Well, and I'll throw this out. Look at, there's one uh, dispatch lab that's, that's trying to create a new blockchain that's backward compatible to ERC-20 um, token. Okay. David, any, any follow-up? Well, I, I would just say, yeah, a lot of smart people are working on it. IBM, you know, has thrown their uh, substantial financial resources into the pool. Um, and there are lots of opportunities for reward in this sector. But still, fundamentally, what I see is, um, you know, the way blockchain exists today with its fully distributed innumerable node um, technology where the security really is... Um, baked into the fact that no one can take over more than half the nodes and to achieve that you have to have a large number of nodes and therefore a lot of network connection traffic between them you know that um, is a challenge or fundamentally flawed depending on your perspective and how it's going to get resolved is a big question in my mind cool thanks uh, Jenny next question We don't have any additional questions at this point, Harry. Yeah, no problem. I mean, you know, we're we're rolling with what the, the audience wants to hear. Mike, do you want to kind of pitch in on the, the transaction level, the speed uh, that, that David Hamm was bringing up, if, if you don't mind, sir? Yeah, I mean, from my from a more of a business perspective, not the technical guy that has to carry this stuff out, but I look at it and say, you know, uh, and, and Jenny and I were saying this at the very beginning here today uh, as we're getting onto this this uh what are we using go to webinar yeah you know i remember the days of microsoft net meeting yeah. right? you remember that yeah you couldn't do a video call if you tried right so i sit here in my house in boston and it really doesn't matter if i'm in boston or where i'm at um you know i've got uh, verizon fios right so i got the fibers pulled right up to the house i've got great speed so the technology seems to always figure itself out. I mean, I'm carrying more storage in my Apple Watch, and this is a Gen 1 Apple Watch, uh, than I probably had in my first five computers combined. So it seems to always figure itself out, and I can appreciate the fact that somebody actually has to take that stuff on. I mean, my take on blockchain and kind of where it's going to fit is that, you know, uh, this is stuff that there will be some use cases that are well-intended, you know, kind of fits for blockchain. But there's still other applications that are going to have centralized storage right there. So you, you got to, you know, it's, it's like trying to use a hammer when you're trying to drive screws, right? Like there are going to be the right tools for the jobs. And I think that people will figure that stuff out and where you need from a technical execution, the blockchain to support the use case 
and where you need from a business standpoint, uh, kind of the trust and security factors, you know, that's where people will find it. I mean, and the geez, interface, because you know, the blockchain well, itself doesn't really have a beautiful interface that people can sort of really communicate with, mere yeah. mortals. Right. And, you know, you look at some of the stuff that people are doing, too, like, right, you know, like, and I, and I carried a Nokia for a long time after I left uh, Microsoft, you know, and kind of ran Windows Phone. But, you know, as I sit here now with my iPhone 8, of course, now I just got this a couple months ago and they announced a whole new slate of them today. But that's that's life in tech, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, like I can I can walk up and pay at so many places with the phone or even the watch, right? The watch lets me do the Apple Pay stuff, too. So. Uh, I think, you know, the technology just keeps getting faster, smaller, people figure it out. The problem that, that nobody ever really, you know, it's kind of unsolvable still is, is kind of that uh, perpetual connectivity, right? There are still times and places where we're not connected to the internet and we feel lost when we're in those moments, especially people who do what, what we do, right? Uh, but, but, you know, and sometimes that's nice, right? To go up into the mountains of Vermont and New Hampshire here in New England and kind of get away from it all is nice. But where we do require that connectivity because it has to write back or it has to check balance or those kind of things, you know, obviously those those scenarios are still going to come up. But, you know, people I, I feel like people will solve that stuff. Um, and it's it's not a reason to me. And I don't think David Hamm is suggesting this in his question. To me, it's not a reason to avoid it. It's more of an opportunity to embrace it, solve the technical challenges and then figure out how we reduce friction and kind of make things run more smoothly. Uh, where blockchain is the right technology to do it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make a, a attempt at a funny story here. While folks, I'm going to uh, ask of you if you have questions, now would be the time to queue them up. If we don't have questions, that's fine too. But let me tell you a funny story from just yesterday. So uh, had had my birthday yesterday, went out for the traditional Mexican meal and put on the funny hat and they sang happy birthday to you. Got a margarita or two in talking to my wife. Uh, she's in education. She's a compliance officer at a private school. And she told a funny story. The school started several days ago last week. And um, just uh, earlier this week, Monday, uh, a prospective student was introduced who wanted to enroll. That's fine. They, they can certainly accommodate someone enrolling a few days late. And um, the individual, the, the parents, the, the, the father uh, claimed he had made a bunch of money in high tech and could he pay for the entire year's tuition uh, today, just in advance. He, he, that's how he rolls. And he had uh, $15,000 in cash with him for the entire year's tuition. And then he, he added a love tap of $500 for the foundation so he had $15,500 in cash in their lobby, wanted to pay a year in advance and didn't really want to answer too many questions. And then the school being a private school welcomes $15,500 cash in this day and age in another student. And they said, well, you have to go get a cashier's check, right? We, we just, we're, we're not able to accept that kind of cash in our lobby. Um, so you know where I'm going with this is that led to a conversation akin to the cannabis industry, which was on our short list of suspects on how he made his money and is walking around with cash. But it, it, it became, well, you know, how would you accept that kind of money for somebody who doesn't desire to work within the banking system? So that that is just a reiteration of the prior story I told. But, you know, Mike, you're, you're going to see this storytelling, right? We're, we're at, you know, my my example with analytics is we're at the five and a quarter inch floppy disk stage with analytics. I mean, we're right at the beginning of that epic. You, you could argue the same with blockchain, but you know, Mike, you're you're kind of more closer to the feet on the street. You're going to have MSPs that have the storytelling. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, you know, what's exciting about this and the opportunity, and this is where, you know, and Grace and I are going to, we've just met over this kind of uh, this panel and I'm interested to learn more about it because I think the opportunity to solve customer problems where, you know, like right now, I mean, you know, I always joke that kind of Android versus iPhone, it's like Android's like a do-it-yourself kit where iPhone's like a finished product, right? I think, you know, from a, from a, if I want to do blockchain, whatever the heck that means, whether it's a cryptocurrency thing or it's an act, application, um, what to me I didn't know about before learning about Grace and her company is that 
you know, there's somebody that meets you in the middle and gives you kind of a low coding environment so you can build blockchain based solutions to solve those customer problems. Now, I think it's almost like, uh, and I'll say this is, you know, I worked at Progress Software before coming to Averitech. Progress has a, a, a product called OpenEdge, which has been around for 30 years. So it's kind of a database and app dev all in one. So we had uh, many of our customers were software companies who built products on OpenEdge. They were not in the least bit interested for, to just to overgeneralize in telling customers, their prospective customers, that they built the product on OpenEdge because nobody knew what it was. Didn't have it. You know, if you said it's, ba it's a .NET application built on SQL Server, people would be like, oh yeah, we, we use that in our other stuff, right? Like that's good from a compatibility standpoint. For them to talk about what it was built on was a liability in the progress open edge world, or that was the perception at least. So bringing it back to blockchain, I think it's the same kind of thing. If a customer has a need and you are some type of solution provider to them and you have a way to fix it, you've got a tool or an application that can do it, whether it's something you're doing on uh, Grace's platform or you're doing, you know, through whatever other means, telling them that it's blockchain based, you know, for some customers is going to be an attractant and for others, it's going to introduce confusion. So people don't always need to know how the sausage gets made, but they yeah. should know to, and be able to be confident that whatever you're providing to them is going to meet their needs and that it's going to be secure and trustworthy and all that kind of stuff. If it happens to be blockchain based, great. But I think <laughs> that, you know, that's, that's how a lot of, I think MSPs are going to get into some of this stuff is it's like, the what they're trying to solve is important, the how it gets done, less so. Uh, funny, funny you say that because literally last night we stood up a new domain to put all of the blockchain applications that we're working on because it was make, making people's eyes roll in the back of their head trying to figure out what they did when it, they went to our main site and they're like, wait, you do blockchain and you do auto task? Like, wow. so we're literally just discovering <laughs> how necessary it is to, to, you know, to break those all apart. Yeah. Exactly. So true to my word. I, I, I want to um, take this opportunity to thank everybody. I'm going to jump and I, Beth is still here, I believe, as a panelist to jump in for any questions. True, true statement, Beth? True statement. All right. Yeah. Well, when, I, when I, great. Thank you, Grace. We'll talk soon. Yep. Um, yep. And when I met Beck, I thought he only had one name like Cher, right? I, 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 I thought I thought that was just you're, you're one of these people with one name, Beck. Found out you actually, your first name is Thomas. Um, so there we go. But uh, true to my word, uh, Jenny, again, is what it is. Do, do we have questions lined up or have we filled the void for today with the partner community on blockchain and we'll call it good? At this point, I think we're all clear and ready to go. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, a couple things, guys, a little bit of housekeeping and totally appreciate you supporting uh, MSP Tech Talk. We're deep into our second year of this academic lecture series, and we have sponsors like SolarWinds who behave and underwrite us much like NPR and PBS. Uh, the next talk coming up will be Ben Yarborough from Calyptix. Uh, he's not attending as a vendor. Um, he is a community member. He's a well-established lawyer out in the Carolinas, so hopefully he's uh, heading for the hills, but he brings the unique perspective of an active legal practice as well as an ISV and interacting with the MSP community. So for lack of a better phrase, he's going to talk about legal stuff on the 26th, and boy howdy, he can talk so that will be a full 90 minutes. Bring your questions. Um, I, again, just to uh, point out again, I'll be at Glucon, SolarWinds, Ignite, and Dreamforce over the next two weeks before October 1st. If you're at any of those, let me know. You'll receive the decks uh, from David Hamm. Uh, we have those go out in May as well as today's deck. And any questions, I always welcome at harryb at smbnation.com. Jenny, thanks for your help in the control room. Mike, been too long. Good to circle back. I wish, uh, doggone it, I wish I'd known you were in Buys there five days last week, man, up in Waltham at that Channel Pro event and, and having fun. And I was lonely. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, next time you're in town, man, I'll be around. So just let me know. All right. And Thomas, we're going to have that beer. Uh, I'll ride the ferry over to you and we'll have that beer in Seattle and David Ham. Thanks as always. I'll be down in the Bay Area and we'll do, what was that, Panera Bread? We'll go have coffee again. <laughs> All right.
with, with that said, Jenny, go ahead and take us out. Thank you for attending, folks. Thanks.